From Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to the Lucas and Roddenberry franchises, the Martian Chronicles, and beyond. Science fiction is undeniably a part of our culture. But what exactly is science fiction? And how do you write a science fiction novel? This series will attempt to answer those questions. Okay. Hey, we're yeah. live with Adam and Kate. Say hi, Adam. Oh. Hey. <laughs> Hello. So for people just tuning in and for those that are returning, let's uh, reiterate the message and have it new for people that uh, are just dropping in into the stream. Uh, basically, we're, we're creating some fiction here. And uh, uh, my good friends, Kate and Adam, they're uh, diligent, hardworking engineers that have a company that is absolutely epiphenomenal. This is why the series is called uh, Epiphenomenal and... Epic. 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 This epic. is, you guys hear it first <laughs> on this show. It's epic. You know what? We'll do it again because the thing was, they didn't wow. understand how I was bringing that. So we got Enta, which is epic. 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 Come on. <laughs> we had to do it one more time. I feel like we're back in a class of, uh, I don't know, when did you teachers try and prompt you to the time, yeah. right? right. Yeah. Hello, Mr. Sanderson. Coffee. Hello, there you go. <laughs> Mr. Anderson. <laughs> okay, and so, and what is it, what is your company all about? We Epicness. help other companies become perpetually <laughs> epic. <laughs> yes, yes. But today we're going to have some that. fun here. We're right. continuing mm -hmm. on the science fiction piece, right? So yeah. people who were yeah. last week watching, they would actually see that Kate did this really sultry sort of like... Sultry? Well, I don't know. It seemed like... <laughs> You said silky or something, didn't you? Velvety. Yeah, what was the word? Velvety. Okay, see, this is the problem with the mnemonics, <laughs> right? I, so what happened is I go, because okay, you can imagine, I think, well, I use the word sultry. That came to mind, right? So what can you imagine I would think of that's related to sultry right now? Oh. But there, <laughs> there's Kate who hears that word and thinks sultry. What does that mean? <laughs> Was I sultry in the middle of the night, right? I mean... I was at 4 a.m. No one's sultry at 4 a.m. <laughs> well, now it's 4. It was 4.30. Now it's now it's 4. Changes every time. It gets so. earlier every time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this but, is the uh, female version of the fishing story. It just seems to change and... You yeah, know, that's right, right? Well, it's it's like the show. formation of a, a, of a legend, <laughs> right? Well, this is it. I... Uh, this this week's voiceover, I'm uh, not gonna lie, took me a lot of work. <laughs> I had to research, I had to like time it. I took I don't know how many takes, and then I had to cut it all. So anyway, we'll see how it comes out. I haven't I didn't watch it yet. I didn't watch we're, it. we're gonna see how it comes out. Yes, but in the in the in the spirit of transparency, right? Because we're having mm -hmm. this conversation in terms of self discovery. So I believe there was something barbarous at the end of this delivery that Adam said. Hey, I think we should, you know, chat about this because it, it, it's it's a little difficult, is it? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is hard, like doing these, um, doing these voiceovers. Like, yeah, Dan gives us a series of images in a video format that's like two to three minutes long. Yeah, and then we got to figure out what what message you had in. And now we see if the message I interpret over is the same as <laughs> when you created it. And uh, it's a pretty cool exercise. It's not easy. Um, well, but, let me uh, know, we, don't, we don't know some of the references you're throwing in. So there's a little bit of research to do. But here's, I thought I would cheat and get ahead. But then I realized that his has similar images to one of my videos that is coming up the, the next week coming. And so now I have to wait to see what his is so that I don't overlap messaging. I was like, ooh, you don't even let me cheat and get ahead. I have to wait. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But see how the meta works. And this is the idea of a philosophical relational database of, of propagation. Now, the one heuristic that I want to give you guys that you guys can make your process simpler is in that two-part process that you described, you thought, what is Dan thinking? Uh -uh. Don't even mm -hmm. worry about it. 
this is advice that I mean, not only do I give new creators on the Planksit platform, but I also um, I'm trying to encourage you guys to use as um, as thinkers uh, and creators yourself, right? So right. almost think of it as a state of meditation. I'm just going to use that. Use it how you want, but you listen to it and start thinking of the things that come to mind, right? Now, buttress that with exactly what Kate was doing is go on that learning journey, you know, pull up Wikipedia mm -hmm. or pull up um, the Stanford uh, um, Encyclopedia of Philosophy. I think that's what it is, right? At Stanford, great, great articles. Um, it's kind of like, it's kind of like taking intellectual anesthe anesth anesthesia. You, you start up at the top, you're really excited, you know, like the anesthesiologist, if you guys have been in an operation, right? It's like, we're going to mm -hmm. count down to 10. And I always say, fuck it, I'm going to beat it. I'm going to get to 11, you bastard. Damn it, I'm going to 10, 9, 8, 7. <laughs> right? We yeah. just can't, we can't help ourselves. And so I guess the point that I was trying to make is that and some of these articles, like you'll start on that, but you know, what a rabbit hole. And I just say, you know what, that's your judgment then when to pull the ripcord, mm -hmm. right? But do it, you know, go right, let's go do it. I want to see it. Let's see. Let's do it. Oh, you want to see it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Anticipation is killing me. <laughs> In 1818, Mary Shelley birthed a new genre of fiction with her famous story, Frankenstein. However, it wasn't until over 100 years later in 1926 that the publisher Hugo Gernsback popularized the term science fiction with his ongoing publication, Amazing Stories. It was the first magazine devoted solely to science fiction, including the works of the great Jules Verne, 1828 to 1905, H.G. Wells, 1866 to 1946, and Edgar Allan Poe, 1809 and 1849. Perhaps best known for his horror writing and dark poetry, Edgar Allan Poe also wrote science fiction stories, the most notable of which may be the unparalleled adventures of one's hands befall, relating a man's balloon journey to the moon with a combination of scientific precision and astonishing fantasy. Jules Verne was a French novelist, poet, and playwright. He is famous for his creation of the Voyages Extraordinaires, a series of best-selling adventure novels, including Journey to the Center of the Earth, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and Around the World in 80 Days. His novels are always very well documented and generally set in the second half of the 19th century and always take into account the technological advances of the time. In short, he imagined the future as buildable and practical. H.G. Wells, considered by many to be the father of science fiction, famous for the time machine, visible man, or war of the worlds, believed that human experience was at the center of science fiction. Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, in fact, disagreed on the philosophies of science fiction. I do not see the possibility of comparison between his work and mine. We do not proceed in the same manner. It occurs to me that his stories do not repose on very scientific basis. No, there is no report between his work and mine. I make use of physics, he invents. I go to the moon in a cannonball discharged from a cannon. There is no invention. He goes to Mars in an airship, which he constructs of a metal which goes away with the law of gravitation. But show me this metal. Let him produce it. H.G. Wells believed that a fantastical leap was fine as long as it was grounded in the human experience. The interest he invoked was a practical one. He wrote and believed and told that this or that thing could be done, which was not at all at that time done. He helped his reader to imagine it done and to realize what fun excitement or mischief would ensue. Many of his inventions have come true, but these stories of mine do not pretend to deal with possible things. They are exercises of the imagination in a quite different field. Which do you believe? There we go. What do you guys think? Now you know. Love it. Now you know. Now you know. All right. Now you know. <laughs> I, I did enjoy the... Uh, you know, the competing philosophies about what fiction should be. Should it be something that's like achievable, at least by today's standards in terms of we imagine? Or do we take something like H.G. Wells that says, whatever, build a time machine, but then write about the human experience 
around the time machine. And why does it matter? You know, <laughs> but that is intriguing. Yeah. What do you think, Kate? I have a really strong opinion on this one, actually. <laughs> oh, I think that um, Jules Verne, who really wanted to base everything on scientific principle, would not have been able to imagine a world that we have today. So he has limited his ability to portray pot possible um, you know, inventions because he hasn't thought outside of the box, outside of the realm where H.G. Wells was able to think outside of that box, right? Because he was imagining the impossible and it might not have been exactly the way that, you know, one could get there, right? Obviously, but it, thinking outside of the box, I think is where you really start to create the impossible, right? I, I have to really... Uh, applaud that actually assessment Kate right so from a philosoph I want to tell you where the value of that philosophical insight is when you when you think about what you're advocating for is you're advocating for something that is in some way we'll say not real a metaphysics an imagined sort of futurity right okay yep. this is a huge divide philosophically huge right it's, you know one side it's not real this kind of thing right but the, the proof that you're offering, okay, this is how dramatic it is that you're framing it this way, follows that principle of hindsight is 2020. So it gets us further down the, the pathway, so to speak. We can turn around and look back and say, oh, yes, there was no perceived way to get there using a purely deterministic system, okay? So this is kind of the idea is that is there there is at least some room for right? Some imagine of imagination and some creativity in yeah. the journey that we're taking. And that, that is really, really interesting. Um, that's a really interesting insight and, and something that I hope we build on in the book. Oh yeah. <laughs> right. Well, there, well, even if you look at the divide a, between Adam and I, so sorry, Adam, I'll just throw this in quick. Like Adam is heavily sci-fi in the like, Star Trek. Can hear you. Um, All of them. Everybody can hear you. Do your words carefully. Oh, right. <laughs> to, but just to let you know, Adam's not. <laughs> yeah. He's really a figment of your imagination. It's actually not real. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, but he's really like more into the the star trek star wars stuff like that and i really my like fantastical genres like you know harry potter twilight true blood like i love that sort of like totally not even in this realm of laws of physics nature what we know today kind of thing and so it's it's an interesting blend for us to come together and write a book <laughs> mm. oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So do we have to like in a preemptive pre 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 sort of strike, we have to actually, you know, come up with how do we resolve dispute? I guess. We just, what is the nature yeah. of the dispute? Well, Adam's a black belt, so I'm going to say not physical. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Deal. <laughs> black belt. You got to tell, tell us more on that. You can't leave us hanging with a black belt. Um, sure. Uh, when I was 12, I, uh, my dad worked with a girl whose brother was a Muay Thai world champion. And, uh, he said, Hey, give us a lesson sometime. So we went down and, um, he gave us a lesson and built us some cool moves. And I thought it was pretty much the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And now here, uh, 20, Jesus, 27 years later. I've never stopped going, so I learned a lot in that period of time. And uh, yeah, so for anyone who doesn't know what Muay Thai is in UFC, it's the stand-up part where they punch and kick and knee and elbow each other. So yeah, that's my story. I competed for a while, but um, my wife is the true champion. That's how I met my wife. Actually, she was a uh, world champion and traveled the world, beating up people. Wow. So. <laughs> So from, so from really, that, don't, don't fight with his wife. Yeah. No, the whole family. Are the kids doing it too? Uh, a little bit. We teach them in the basement during uh, this whole predicament. Uh, we've been running lessons with them just to kind of keep them active. 
didn't keep them interested. But they think it's pretty. Now, is it just a Hollywood cliche that you go around kicking trees for your training, you know, like to build your shin strength up and stuff like that? Uh, like Van Damme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, in Thailand, I think they actually do. They're crazy over there. Um, <laughs> but we do have uh, eggs in the gym that are with like sand. So they're honestly, they feel like concrete. So you can very lightly like tap your shin on it over and over and over to toughen up the, the skin and kind of kill all the nerves. Because in Muay Thai, oh. you do a lot of shin on shin banging and things like that, uh, and it hurts. <laughs> so, wow. Okay. It hurts well, good, that's it. You know? <laughs> yeah. So we've got a security detail in in this sort of group. So right. it's, you know, the brains on the bra. It's always been that way. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I I think um, <laughs> you're both, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, I'm just the sultry spice we add in. <laughs> That's right. That's oh, yeah. So now, now you're both conscious of about this like sultry business, right? And now you got another yeah. voiceover to do. You're building that up oh. yourself. Right? There's there's this so thread that, of this causality that, you know, is tied to identity. And it's like, what will she do next, right? So I, feel like, I feel like my voiceover needs a label now, Dan. What are huh? you going to call my voiceover? I feel as though my voiceover now needs a, if if Caitlin is sultry, what what would you call mine? <laughs> this is this is a, a Hegelian trap, okay? And so Hegel, what he liked to do? No, no, no. But hear me out. It's just, and it's not an absolute. It's just that's what came to mind was the concept of a Hegelian yeah. trap. So we're putting two competing things together where um, it's it's not a competing thing. I'm not talking about about an imagined sense or a causal sense. What I'm saying, actually, I'm talking about an imagined sense. So I can honestly say to myself that I have a characterization that is that I was thinking of with Adam, right? And it was actually a little mm -hmm. bit more of a critique, but I'll bring it up in a second. Then we've already established yeah. what we were talking about with with the sultry business, right? So it's, yeah. it doesn't logically follow that it's a characteristic opposite of what Kate is, right? Or I could spend some time and think about it and assign that label, right? But the thing that I wanted to make as a suggestion, and this is for Adam on his last voiceover, and then also for Kate on future voiceovers, is... It's going to be increasingly difficult um, if the realm from which you narrate is based entirely on, well, not based entirely, um, if, if you're filling it with bio biographical types of things, right? Mm. So you'll realize that as you're seeing those images um, in terms of um, like kind of causal sort of things or things you've seen before, there's only really a finite number of ways you can kind of take that narration. However, it will open up the doors of creativity, you know, so to speak. I'm just giving you a metaphor because there's no door in there, you know, into the homunculized sort of brain or whatever, right? Yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's this idea here that you have to you, – you can be completely creative with it. You did a great job, by the way, but I'm saying you can be really creative. So as you're going through that creative process, number one, don't think about what I was thinking. D mm -hmm. shouldn't come through your mind at all reform associate with what's dropping in front of you right um and then also realize that y you don't have to narrate the quote that's a restriction right you could say something completely different than the quote mm -hmm. you could you, you so just uh, there's no limitations is all i'm saying okay all right challenge accepted right. be free little bird be free and besides yeah. that, we talked about why Adam, didn't we have a conversation where we said that you'd be a good audio book reader? <laughs> he did say that. <laughs> yeah. So we've already established, Kate, that the sultry voice is out. When it comes time that this voice is going online for the audio book, it's it's gonna Adam. be it's Adam. Oh, okay. There you go. Okay. I'm the, <laughs> well, I'm wait the a minute. Well, there's an option in the publishing industry we can dramatize the voices. Right, so we could have like Adam playing a character and then Kate playing a character. We mm. could do that. I like that. She can be the crazy the world of possibilities. That's yeah. right. So, or we have a voice back. off. A voice off. A voice off. <laughs> yeah, maybe our readers, maybe our readers and our viewers decide whose voice gets to narrate the book by the end of this podcast series. That's a great idea. There you go. There you go. 
Okay. <laughs> One of the things that I'm trying to do and notice this, the subtle sort of like, it, but it's a very authentic way. I'm going to leave a section after we're done recording for 15 seconds. Okay. So okay. we scratch your chin and we say, why is he doing that? Right. Well, mm-hmm. on, on YouTube, there's a, an ability to bring in these other like things that you can click on afterwards. And yeah. fortunately or fortunately, we haven't taken advantage of that. There's something like writing in the margins of a book that I don't want to have a pop-up show up on, you know, Kate's or Adam's face. Right. I just don't mm-hmm. like that. So when we say end stream or we're going to end today's episode, I'm going to let it continue to record without us on the canvas, so to speak for 15 seconds right. before I ixnay the, you know, the action a, you know, okay. <laughs> right. Then Excellent. we have this ability to have, you know, either, have this video linked to the next one in the series or see, we decide like we talked about before, let's have a guest on that has their own sort of, um, you know, segue or thought about a particular uh, subject. Right. Yeah. Super excited for that. Hopefully our first guest next week, maybe, maybe. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be good. So what, what were we, what were we focusing on with that fellow? I forget his name. Uh, his name's Ya, and he's an architect. So we oh, were right. kind of trying to imagine how, in the future, if things are much more virtual and there's a much more interactive virtual environment, how that might change the ar- architects of where we live and work. Um, yeah. So I think it'll be an interesting thought experiment for somebody trained in the history of architecture. Um, and uh, he's he even says he's got a special stylus he can sketch right on screen. With us. So. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to cool. start something here that I would say that that is is going on with Adam and Kate. That while you're paying attention, and we're all in this conversation with this fellow, right? Mm-hmm. And so what that would be is building on the theme that we heard from the little clip video is that the way the 2020 perspective works, looking back on you know where we've come from. Say we were in you know 2600, looking back at 2020 we realize that even the best of minds are going to have a certain sort of limitation. And as we keenly listen to, you know, what he's talking about, I want all of us to kind of think, you know, from that sort of uh, that mind space to think that there's a whole world of possibilities that are related to that somewhat, but how many degrees of separation and, and how, you know, how, how different can it unfold, you know, is really, really, really interesting way of thinking about it. Right. Mm hmm. Like, I imagine, um, what if we were to have something like a severe restriction on, on, uh, uh, on resources? So this would be, from a Darwinian standpoint, this would be like um, uh, a real pivot point uh, in history for like an evolutionary sort of punctuation, as we like to call it, mm-hmm. this thing that was kind of dismissed i guess but i just like the terminology right this i think it's pretty much out of favor this punctuated in- equilibrium sort of theory i don't know where mm-hmm. it sits in the evolutionary um we um it's interesting you bring that up dan we we actually like and we talked about this the last time we started a timeline right like what happens 50 years from now 100 years 200 300 400 500 600 to where our book is taking place um and one of the major events or like headlines in one of the years is actually all all mining of resources on earth is banned Mm. and it's only intergalactical mining like other planets another planetary mining is is how we are like sustaining ourselves so it actually reaches a point where we don't allow it on our planet Mm. Mm. you know it's interesting cultural scenarios that can arise there right because if if resources get scarce then, you know, you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, people that might be higher up on the, uh, on the hierarchy, they start to drop down, right? And, you know, what happens, right? When all of a sudden, you know, you're worried about, call it first world problems, and now you're worried about starving or energy or whatever. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's, you know, good to take a moment and reflect, like, well, what does that world look like? Like, there's, pockets of um you know not everything's sunshine and roses 
right? It doesn't matter what the future is. It's not Star Trek where, where we've kind of solved all the problems, right? It's messier, <laughs> you know? So what does that look like? You know, and if you're, if you're in space on a space station, air becomes a currency, right? Um, things like that. So, you know, it makes me think of um, Christopher Nolan's movie Interstellar when they're talking about time as a resource when they're going near the black hole and like weighing their options, right? Your, your narrative can change and stuff that is not is worthless, well, not worthless, but for taken for granted, all of a sudden becomes like a plot driver or very important, yeah. right? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, <clears throat> I want to I want to throw a bit of a surprise into the into the mix here, right? You guys are like, That's Ooh, my surprise face. Right? There you go. Yeah, <laughs> I can't get any more surprised. I'm already surprised. <laughs> Okay, hit us. In addition to the homework of voiceover, Kate, and then this is a shared project, okay? Yeah. Here it is. This is a, a YouTube channel of Jordan Peterson, okay? And um, there's this lady. Uh, I don't, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her first name pr right, but it's Yomi Park. Have you guys heard of her before? No. Okay. What I would like you guys to do is to yeah. watch that video for next week. Um, okay. This was such an impactful video uh, as uh, a young woman's struggle from North Korea. Okay. So Jordan Peterson interviews her about her struggle into China, her partial integration into South Korea and eventually being picked up for a book publishing deal by Penguin Random House. Wow. So um, I think she really shines a light on, um, you know, some of the, 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 uh, the issues that we seem to be um, preoccupied with is all I'm going to say. So watch the video okay. and we'll chat about it next week. I won't do that a lot, but that's how impactful I think the video will be. Um, okay. At least it was for me. Okay. All right. Um, back to the book. Um, where are we at right now for readers on the book? Right, we're still in early stages for sure. But what, what would you guys? How would you describe where your guys are at in the creative process? I think we're exploring themes still. Right. I think we're we're starting to slowly crystallize. I think the purpose, the story it wants to tell and the meaning behind it and, and kind of, you know, how fantastical does it need to be? How much realism is there going to be? Like, you know, and, and we had kind of, you know, to really ground it, had kind of settled on this idea of um, an opening scene where the main character like wakes up and s describing that process um, and waking up inside a you know with a simulated sunrise versus actually going outside and excuse me That's well, uh, actually going outside and seeing a real sunset and contrasting those two and that contrast being a um a metaphor <laughs> for the transformation yeah. that this character goes under so i think that was kind of our starting point where we we're like okay we need to really nail this opening scene because it, it's going to set the stage for important things later on yeah and we've talked about like little scenes where um like ideas or pivotal moments have happened and we've flushed out like little scenes like kind of on the key i would call them like like major event headline pieces right but there's some things that we haven't flushed out yet like what is this character's actual company do mm. right uh we know that he's a senior leader right and we know that he's fairly well off mm. and and but we don't know exactly what they do yet we've thought about it we've talked about it but like we haven't like there's details of that we haven't honed in yet but we we have talked about like some major instances and things that happen along his journey Right. So we have like a very high, high level plot to the to the whole book. 
with a whole bunch of subplots well, that have potential of growing. <laughs> can I throw in a, a, a maybe that you could consider for the person's job? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> think of um, the, the, the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, right? And so we've already established that there's going to be no more mining. But you have to think, how do we weave that into the storyline? Yeah. Right. So if um, if the character and the interaction, if this is the environment that she actually gets to work from, um, I think there's oh, um, there's ways to write into the story the um, the concepts of where she you know actually works in, and, and especially fill in a backstory about w- what's going on in the environment. Right. So she could be a research scientist is what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I actually kind of thought like, does it matter? Like we can describe the working he, environment. It doesn't mean she or he or whatever. We haven't established a he or a she, right? But sure. But in terms of like the actual industry or the job, like, does it matter? Do we have to say, can we just leave that unspoken? We can describe the environment, the interactions, the people, the, you know, the, Strategy because this ultimately is a business book, right? So, does it matter if it's they're a space mining company or a space marketing company or whatever? Or you know, maybe that could be research really- or if it's actual company. We're not trying to really plan a future that says it's a utopia with no companies, it, it, yeah. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. That's so, really cool. That's really cool. So you got to be able to to make it so that it's it's kind of like a like a microcosm. Well, there's this interesting thing that I've been framing. There's a, there's a cosmology. If you look at like um, Christian symb- symbol symbology, right, or symbolic mm-hmm. sort of or symbols, you look like a cosmology on one side. On the other side, you have microcosm, which is basically like the individual Kate or Adam experience, right? Connected from your brain to your brainstem, right? This whatever, however you envision consciousness. So there's that mm-hmm. gap between the whole sort of big realm of things, big picture, and then you know what our society does, and then there's the individual microcosm, right? So basically, what we're saying is that the the idea of culture for an organization means that there's just one level above that is kind of like small group interactions, right? And mm-hmm. so. Maybe maybe the company, generic company descriptor of the company of the future, are ones that work in, um, you know, dyna- dynamic models, small groups sort of things, right? Like, you know, we put groups of people together that are 15 to 20 people instead of like huge groups of 200 or 400, right? I, I don't know, right? That's one way to kind of look at, you know, how, how like what is the size of the group that, that they're involved with, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this is actually an interesting thing because they're already talking about like future state of companies being n- no longer huge, massive companies anymore, right? They're already talking about that sort of like small group uh, partnership collective being the a potential path for the future for future economy already, right? Which is kind of what you're you're. I think you're touching on here, which is a really interesting kind of philosophy of like, what does that breakdown look like versus the whole like monopoly, which we've historically have seen a lot of, right. Especially telecommunications and, and particularly in Canada, it's like heavily monopolized, large companies just own the industry. Yeah. So yeah, well, what does the future in our book look like? We're not sure what things that we've talked about. Like, so we've talked about different aspects. We liked not actually labeling what it is that they do because yeah. it's not the point. It's the journey that the company takes through the mm-hmm. leadership change and through this individual's journey that is the story. And the kind of the point is, is that it's transferable. It's not industry specific. It's not company specific it's not size specific right it's it's these are business aspects that if any company does today 600 years in the future it's going to drive the right behaviors and so i think there's a really good value like to adam saying like maybe we never mention what it is they do doesn't matter yeah 
I think that's a good starting point. Let's at least, tr you know, try and, you know, create yeah. the visuals around, um, you know, so we have to say what kind of emotions, we'll go back to the waking up sort of analogy again. And of course, I mean, I easily can put in, um, I can use the waking up metaphors and the sun on your face and uh, um, the shared human experience of that being uh, euphoric in a way, right? I mean, it's it, just like sunsets, people are drawn towards mm -hmm. like heliotropic magnets, right? <laughs> like we can't help but like and enjoy the sun, yeah. right? It's our, Did you our see sun. my sunrise this morning? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, me too. Um, Kevin, Kevin, I posted on Instagram uh, my Sunday. beautiful sunrise. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> but that, maybe that's a cool so idea. The point is that I can do I can do the metaphor speaking, like our real writing, but then from that we're gonna I would say probably focus on process, right? Like something that this person is doing, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, for like let's do a, a particular day in the life of so and so, right? Mm. Yeah, exactly. And that kind of speaks to what's going on, right? Every movie has the opening scene, right? Where it's just kind of setting the tone and the stage and the characters and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Because um, you made me think of something, Dan, right? In our world we imagined, you're kind of chipped in and it can regulate your sleep. So you can sleep like three hours and be totally refreshed. Um, yeah. and then we can like wake you up and instead of that, like groggy kind of, uh, you know, zombies kind of slither out of wake bed. Up like I do. You know, <laughs> yeah, you're a morning person, right? And then, you know, the, you know, maybe the systems, you know, play some nice music that slowly gets louder and it, maybe your wall simulates a sunrise and it's meant to be like very charming and very inviting, but if, if this has become like habitual or whatever, it would mean nothing to you. It might even be an annoyance when you wake up, you're like, ah, turn it off. Like I'm not interested. Right. Um, because you don't have the emotional impact of, a, of sitting in front of a real Santorini sunset. Right. Um, yeah. That might be an interesting place to play. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I agree. But I, one thing that's a hang up for me is the, I like the technology of the, you know, you kind of plug in and you accelerate or make your sleeping experience more efficient. Okay. The mm -hmm. issue and the hang up on the narrative that I have for that is that it needs to somehow connect these two dots. It needs to connect the dots that, you know, from a, um, a scientific standpoint and sleep studies, they're saying that I think it's around five to six hours into sleep is when you enter REM sleep, which is that real spindle washing mm -hmm. kind of healing uh, you, you know, dream state that's required yeah. for like a regenerative kind of process. So either we have to figure out how it induces, we that. It induces that immediately. And, you know, here's the beauty about language or we can literally just make the claim and say, we wave the magic wand. That's the reality. Or we spend chapters and chapters explaining how we do it. Right. So right? are we going to HG Wells this shit or Vernon? it? That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you just see it was for Christ's sakes. <laughs> What's up for you to figure out? I'm an engineer by trade. I don't want to do it in my own book. Screw off. Screw off. I'm a uh, oh, Wells girl. <laughs> I think you can, uh, not really a middle ground, but you can say, yeah, and accelerates the by. And if we did a little research, we could create two or three sentences that use like the right terminology that tells the reader like sciency, sciency, sciency. Okay. And they move on. Right. It's not just like, Oh, it accelerates your, your sleep state. It gives a little oh, bit Adam, of fall into that trap. You realize that everyone's going to shake their finger at you and say, you know, show, don't tell. So remember we're yeah. doing this process. You're going to tell, and then I'm okay. going to try and show it. Right. Okay, fair. The key yep. is that we've got to weave it in there so that, and you'll notice it when it weaves in. You'll be like, "Oh yes, okay, right." Okay. We got right. to that, that has to show the journey, right? You have to go from the description into the storytelling, right? Okay. So bullet list, right? That's what we're going to work on. Yes, right. sir. Okay. So we got to think. <laughs> Maybe well, okay. Well, let's just go with in this for the sake of moving this forward. Let's just go with it. we're going to magic wand this one. It's just that's how it works. You know what? This is actually a really good point because you can magic wand stuff and then you can always go back and produce, you know, explanations. It might be mm -hmm. easier to do 
passive pass of the, the magic wand. That way, the minutia and the details don't change the trajectory of the, the theme, which it does complicate it, right? So mm -hmm. I would say Harry Potter away. Yeah. <laughs> Wingardium Leviosa. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, first draft, right? You may look at it and go, this is too, you know, Harry Fairy. So we're going to, you know, put a little bit more scientific reason is, reasoning in yeah. there, right? We could do that later. There's a balance, right? If we get us along a certain path and realize we've waged this magic wand a lot. <laughs> but we go back and like, you know, science-y it a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No one's going to believe that we're engineers. No one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, okay. So, yes, for now, we'll magic wand this. We obviously have to do maybe a little research or get some input from a, a person who's has more insight into the, the chemical process that your body goes through in reaching that deep REM sleep. Because the idea was is that it would induce it immediately. We'll figure the how out as we go. But um, the, the crux, the crux is, is that shit's hitting the fan at work mm. with this character and so he skips his sleep cycle to take on meetings okay and the reason why this is super important is because there's no more time zones right you're not just having meetings with people around the world at different hours of the day you're having people you're having meetings with people across the galaxy and in different like so messages will come across and they could be like days old we'll have to look at like how we figure out the whole speed of light interplanetary communication mm -hmm. time lapse that's mm -hmm. going to be interesting but yeah. like <clears throat> the, we're going to be having communications that way as well so like time zones doesn't matter anymore like you just you're you're on or you're off and you book it in right but because shit sitting the fan at this guy's place of work, he skips these sleep cycles and he skips too many and he has a health breakdown. Okay. And I, I'm saying he, we haven't fully finalized that, but I think maybe he, but so that, that's like, it's kind of critical. That sleep ac aspect is critical to the story. And then really that in the future, and we talked a little bit about the medical side of things, is uh, we've reached a point, and, and this is really interesting because it's about, you know, um, a series of pandemics that, you know, viruses have now mutated. And you can see where today is a reality starting point for this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> series of mutations drove us further and further into this isolation, into this technological advancement and then where it got so heavily burdened on the medical system that if you didn't follow the medical process that's your choice but you don't get covered yeah yeah how are you guys with a, a dystopian aspect where there's communities where it's it's like if you're going to go and live medical free then you actually have to move upstate like sorry <laughs> Right? Yeah, because I think it's, it's important uh, to acknowledge that those subcultures exist, right? This character, you know, where he said, well, he's pretty well off. He's going to kind of live a bit of a high castle. But yeah, we should acknowledge that there's the fringes of society, right? Um, where, yeah, maybe people don't have, or, or they refuse to connect in, into the virtual world, or they refuse to get inoculated or whatever. Um, and we can kind of play on that later, right? Like maybe our character has to interact with those characters in some fashion. And we see like some cultures colliding in some way. I think that could be super interesting. Um, but yes, yeah. absolutely. Like, I don't think we're imagining a, a perfect future. I, I think it's going to be a, yeah. a little, little messy. Well, what I like, I want to think about like traveling and vacations for a minute, right? So I can parachute mm -hmm. into a new culture and and play pretend, right? If I if I get on a plane and go to you know uh, Bangkok or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nothing changing about my identity, but we we generally, as a rule, human sort of rule is that as we travel the world and experience different cultures, it's actually enriching. So it's really weird and 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 not compatible to me why 
um, the ideological imprints actually start to, to um, you know, cause abrasions. I, I would speculate that it's largely because, you know, Kate says that this is how your community has to be. And there's this like forceful applied sort of, you know, uh, you know, piece on that. And so what I'm proposing for you guys on this in terms of little microcosms communities is to say that, you know, there is a, a community with an eco, an economic system like such and such over here, and there's one with one over here. And then there's, you know, just like we plan a vacation, we go, well, I want to go do R&R, &R. I'd like this kind of, uh, mm -hmm. you know, vacation, and I go and kind of pick where I want to go. And I, you know, that's kind of what I'm seeing here to, to you know, to describe this, um, at least do the, the juxtapositions on, on cultures, right? And so then by matter of choice, the person, the character, the protagonist can go, uh, you know, whichever way. And I have to bring up something about the, the male-female thing, okay? Yeah. So there's, there's a, another option where we never define it, right? So let's... Ooh, gender neutral! Yeah. So, you know, there is the real reality that that's a popular conversation right now. Are we ambulance chasers and headline guys? It doesn't matter. We're here to have a logical conversation about whether or not that is something that we want to articulate the narrative around. Hmm. Right? Hmm. So what we ask ourselves is either what's at stake if we do that? And so hmm. could we say, arguably, that if we stay gender neutral, that the at least the traditional forms of of um, imagined relationships, right? I guess, um, are not, uh, you know, some of the cliches that we can call, fall into, like romance and stuff like this, right? I'm not saying they wouldn't exist in this other sort of relationship, but they, um, the the flavor of them would be different. And so, yeah. whether or not we want to develop and make that part of the narrative is that's I think how you have to think about it. So I really, really like that. And, and I'm going to tell you why, because as we're right now, we're in this place where the world is discovering that there's, we're not just binary, right? We're not just one or the other. We're not just, there's all spectrums of gender association. And I, I think as we mature and we grow over the next 600 years, it'll really become super irrelevant. Mm. You know what I mean? Like everybody will just, you know, be kind of, it, it's just not going to be a conversation anymore. Okay. And I, right. so I really like that idea. I don't know, Adam. One gender specific protagonist, right? Yeah. The only um, thought I had is, you know, males and females have different strengths. Right, like broad, speaking on broad terms. So, if we were to get into some of the kind of leadership styles and strengths that a male character might bring versus a female character, um, and kind of like versus like emotions, probably would be a huge one, right? Hold on, I got yes. a question for you. Yes. Hold on. Okay. Do women and men? have significantly different strengths because of the gender association that we have put upon them, or are they born with those strengths? Uh, yes. <laughs> you, <yeah. laughs> Gentlemen <Damn>. in the front. <laughs> it's your book. It honestly is. But right. For somebody that would, would, would raise their hand from a biological standpoint, um, yeah. I, I would say that we want to be careful to make sure we, we, we iron this out really carefully. This is a very important claim, right? Yeah. Is that women tend to have, um, are less risky. Okay. And tend towards more communal type of, um, uh, activity. Okay. Right. Wait, you say tend. Do you mean because there is a biological chemi chemical makeup in their DNA that tells them that? Or do you say tend to because that's how they've been raised with our society's pressures upon them? Right. 
I'm going to make the assumption that it is actually biological. And, and, and so the, the, the quote unquote evidence that I have for that is how we watch um, like other primate tribes. Right. Okay. And so typically you have to think about what happens is that the males compete for the females. Right. And I'm, and so the, 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 the feminist trap here is to say, I don't want to be a prize. That's not the point. Biologically, Men compete amongst themselves for women's attention, right? And yeah. ultimately, women are the ones that select the men, right? We might think it might be the other way around. Unilever might be doing ad campaigns for like soap and stuff like that. But quite honestly, like, you know, like men are trying to get there to the woman, right? Biologically, right? This is kind of the idea. You see it across multiple species, fair. Right. Mm -hmm. So, to what extent does culture override those sort of underlying sort of um, uh, tendencies and not saying that every single human being has those exact kinds of tendencies, but what happens with the, the graph that you see behind you on, on the Enta branding is that we can say for the most part, and I don't know how, what percentage of the population, but the one that's opened the door for the phylogenetic chain to open up to get to where we biologically are today, it can you know consists of those types of propagations, right? You, would you agree with that? Okay. Oh, you, well, wait a minute. We should pause on that because it's it's there's a you know if we we're drawing a cartoon, there would be like a question bubble that just popped up there, right on top yeah. of your head. Yeah, you can edit that in later if you want. <laughs> 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 what? What? what what what's he talking about all i'm saying like you want to talk about um you know a node on a a scale of strengths for gender based off of biological we've significantly amplified it would it even be through our through society's expectations of gender roles would it even be a blip on the radar right if we didn't Okay, then let's, here's the thing. And, like, and, and what other species is not recognizing male, female, right? At what point? So like, as we realize that it's not male, like female, and that it's not, we're not binary, right? We're not mm -hmm. one or the other. Um, or we're not, you know, there's so much more to the spectrum. It, like no other species is having that conscious evaluation either. They're just... Mm -hmm living by instinct. So what does it look like 600 years from now when we've accepted the fact that we're much more complex? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think we Concept. be a little bit careful here um, because if we make things too different, then it's a little bit under or unrelatable. So I think we yeah. have to consider rather than argue or not, argue but like have to decide philosophically one way or another nature nurture i think we want to say how, what do we want to comment on relationships in a in a business or in a community or whatever and male female relationships are among the most interesting when you watch a movie read a book or whatever the dynamics interactions between the two are, are probably the most relatable and kind of most they help move the story forward and they help make the character likable and they help kind of define the values of that person. And um, right, but is it, so, is it the male female relationship? Because that's what you resonate with. I, <laughs> right. Maybe. Like there's a whole like series on Netflix under gay, lesbian and et cetera. Right. Sure. The, and the whole reason that exists is because it relates to the people that see the world in that lens and that operate under that. Like, so, I mean, th here's the problem is we didn't first figure out what is the mechanism for us to fight out disagreements. So like, we're not going to do Muay Thai because I can't, I can't fight Adam. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I don't think it's being over really. I'm just saying, do we want to make a comment on leadership in terms of male and female? Because I think there's definitely a whole, uh, conversation endless conversation probably about diversity and increasing the female leadership in the workplace um and kind of the boys club and all this kind of stuff 
So, hundred percent. Do you you think in six hundred years it's going to be fixed? That's that's assuming there's a problem. I mean, there's a problem. See how I just (laughs) no 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 no. no. That that totally opens it up the whole thing. But here's the thing: we are now five minutes. It's almost the perfect time to to pull the plug. The reason (gasps) is the reason is is because this will be the 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 series for the next topic of conversation it's a great it's a this is not something that's going to go away and uh, but i do think that we're going to have to really understand how we're going to unweave that narrative right whether it's from a gender neutral sort of standpoint or whether it moves back to more of a traditional uh you know type of reality right and i I think that's really important right now i'm on the fence with either one because i think the story can be told in both ways and I think if done well and thoughtfully, you could, um, let's say you created a, a future where some of these biases have kind of gone away. And um, by commenting on that and contrasting that to the present day, you are, in fact, making the statement maybe statement. That you want to make. Right? Okay. I do think we need to acknowledge that there are physical differences and therefore there has to be some sort of difference and where line is maybe is where we need to figure out i don't i don't know i don't know i i we got to pick this up next time i've got a ton of to say on this and i think this is exactly like a really critical topic because we could even break that one down if we're engineering humans and giving them because we're no longer doing natural birth anymore and you're able to adjust their traits. I say we do it this way. We actually give men the ovaries and women get, you know, they get to be the fearless leaders and we just, you know, we surrender and relegate to the matriarchy. It's about fucking time. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is oh. You just go so over the top that the reader's like, are they making fun of this? Are they making fun of well, this? <laughs> it's, like, it's, like it's, so, it's so like... It's like just so out there that it's like, you know, but then how do you know, then it, then it becomes a bit of a satire uh, science it's fiction. You, know? satire. you could take uh, uh, like a Gattaca approach. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Where you're yeah. Assigned, As you gotta go, that's please. 12 o'clock. We have to, okay. the alarm bell is okay. okay. To Say be goodbye. Continued. <laughs> Till next time. Ooh, this is fun. I didn't do it. I didn't do the, I didn't do the, um, oh no, I did do it. Hold on. Holding. Hold.